got more than what we thought about. <laughs> At least maybe I'm speaking to myself. I got more than what I thought about. I thought I was just coming up here just to, we call it the informal exhortation, just to greet everybody and welcome everybody and <laughs> show some announcements. But I'm going to do... Uh, Quickly, I'm going to teach uh, the scriptures, and then we're going to, we'll, this is backwards Sunday, so we'll put everything on the back end and we'll, <laughs> in terms of the giving and announcements and all of that will take place on the back end. But let me pray with you as I jump right into the word. Father, thank you so much for how awesome you are. Give us big hearts to keep pursuing you. In Christ's name, amen. For the next several weeks, I'm beginning a brand new teaching series that I've entitled Power Evangelism. And power Evangelism, as you'll learn, it simply means that God uses spiritual gifts that deals with signs and wonders, healings and miracles to help people come into right relationship with Him and for individuals who already been walking with Jesus to get unstuck and to keep walking. You've seen things happen here on the stage. I want to bring you behind the scenes, so to speak, to let you know, how did he do those things? Luke 9 and verse 1 frames the conversation. When Jesus had called the 12 together, that's the 12 apostles or the original 12 disciples, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Notice I made bold two statements. First, proclaim the kingdom of God. Second, heal the sick. The gospel of Jesus Christ has proclamation of truth and demonstration of power. The gospel must have both effects or both those tentacles. It's two parts. If it just has one and not the other, we're shortchanging the world and we're shortchanging ourselves. The first proclamation of the truth of the gospel are words that we speak. That's the preaching, that's the teaching, that's the conversations. The, proc the, the demonstration of the power is where we see signs, wonders, miracles, and deliverance. I must say this on the front end. We in our westernized world and thinking oftentimes are locked in to what's referred to as Aristotelian thinking. Thinking that like Aristotle framed, that knowledge only comes through the five senses. Touching, seeing, feeling, tasting, smelling. Not true. Yes, knowledge comes from through those five senses, but think about the greatest miracle, salvation. When God changes a person's life, when they make a simple profession of faith by saying, I want to give my life to Jesus. I've tried everything else. I need Jesus. Jesus, be my God. Then something changes. Their worldview changes. Their heart changes. They feel forgiven. They know they're forgiven. They're, they're transformed. Their sin stops. Their lifestyle of righteousness starts instantly. Why? That's the greatest miracle. If that the greatest miracle exists, then lesser miracles of signs, wonders, healing, deliverance, it's a no-brainer. But I get it. It's still very complicated. We still ask questions. How? I'm right where you are. Though I move in the gifts of spirit, I have questions just like you. In fact, I may have more technical questions than you because I've been studying it for like 40 years and I still have questions. But yet, it doesn't limit me from ask, for asking God to use me. Let's frame the discussion around the idea. God has this big, big heart for everybody. And God wants a growing family. He wants a family that just grows. How do you get into God's family? You get into God's family when you invite Christ into your life. Then you become adopted into the family of God. Now remember what I read in Luke 9, verse 1 and 2. Jesus sent 
the 12 apostles out and said, go out and preach the kingdom of God and pray for those who are sick and demonized. And let's see what happened when they went out. Verse 10 tells us of Luke 9. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Here we see the apostles came back, told Jesus what happened. Then Jesus, other people came, Jesus did two things. Proclaimed the kingdom of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. Two, prayed for the sick and asked God to heal them. I want you to see the dual components that must be in the gospel. That's power evangelism. Power evangelism is when the power of God confronts people and they get set free and they get saved. It can happen anywhere through anybody who walks with God. I don't want you to think that you have to be a pastor, you have to be ordained, you have to have been to seminary, you have to have been walking with Jesus for a long time. All of those statements are totally contrary to the Bible. Anybody who is a servant of Jesus, be it one hour or a hundred years, both of you qualify to be used by God because God is interested in using you to turn people from darkness into light and he uses even the supernatural as a way for that to happen. So let's get into it. Take your hands, rub them together. Let's get into the stuff. Here's my second point. God has given you gifts. Every follower of Jesus has been given spiritual gifts. These are not church gifts. These are not gifts for when we have a service. No. These are gifts. They can be used anywhere, anytime, wherever you may be. They're gifts. When I first came to Christ, about two months into my relationship with the Lord, I was 20 years old, I went to visit a friend. Her name was Ruth. Ruth said, let's go and visit. Back then in the 80s, you'd call people brother or sister. Let's go and visit Sister Betty. Now, Ruth was in her 40s. I'm 20. Sister Betty was in her late 40s. We went to Betty's house. She came, answered the doorbell. Then she, when she let us in, she said, look, I just have to sit down. So she sat down on her steps that would go up to the second floor to where the bedrooms are, which was maybe 20 feet from the front door. She just sat there. And when she sat there, she just started just complaining. She said, man, my legs are killing me. And she's, her dress may have gotten to the knees when she sat. She said, look at my calves. And I looked at her calves. They're like twice the size of what their calves should look like. She said, they're just inflamed. I don't know what's going on. And it hurts so much. Now, I'm a Christian for two months at the time. I can't even spell Christian properly. And so my friend Ruth said, David... You know, because Betty said, can you guys pray for me? And Ruth said, David, why don't you pray? I'm thinking, you've been walking with Jesus for like 20 years. Me, two months. <laughs> I don't know. What do you mean? Pray. She said, you pray. I said, okay. So I only saw what my pastors did. I saw him pray for people that were sick. I said, okay, I'll pray one of his prayers. I don't know what else to do. So I said, God, would you heal Sister Betty? And I remember putting my hand around her calf. Bring healing to her. In Jesus' name. Boom, quick prayer. I, didn't, I don't know how to pray long. I've just been Christian two months. This is not quick prayers, quick prayers. So I prayed a quick prayer. I saw her leg shrink. She started jumping up and down. I'm shocked because I didn't know, first of all, that God wanted to hear me pray and that God wanted to use me in this area. Plus, I'm the proverbial left brain person. You don't want Aristotelian thinking? That's all I thought. I'm the scientist. My first two degrees in engineering. All I know are those things. I don't know about this. This is it's all foreign to me. But Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. 
One translation reads, I do not want you to be ignorant. In other words, these spiritual gifts, you can understand them to a measure. You can have a working knowledge of how they operate. So this morning as you see me praying for people, ministering to people, and there are many gifts that were displayed, but you may not have been able to separate them out and recognize, you know, it's like one, I'm hearing a conversation. That's the word of knowledge. Another, you know, I can sense, you know, the broken heart. That's discerning of spirits. It's, they're working very closely and sometimes they're moving like this and you may not know all that's going on. And then, so when you see them, uh, they're weeping, they're crying, they're, you know, it's, this is no hoax. This is not spiritism. This is redemptive activity. People, there are things that's bottlenecking their spiritual walk. And they're getting free. And if I just preached and never did that, our congregation would be shortchanged. And that's why I'm saying to you, God has given you gifts. Now let's get into the text, verse 4, 1 Corinthians 12, so we can see these gifts of the Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom or a word of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge or a word of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts, plural, of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits or discerning of spirits to another speaking in different kinds of tongues and to still another the interpretation of tongues all these are the work of one and the same spirit or one and the same holy spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines this this catalog of gifts are referred to as the gifts of the holy spirit there are nine of them I don't want you to mistake this with other kinds of gifts, other categories or cataloging, cataloging of gifts. Romans 12, we see a list of motivational gifts. We see also Peter talks about, and, and then we see Paul, Paul, Peter talks about other kinds of gifts. And Paul in Ephesians 4 deals with ministry gifts. And in 1 Corinthians 14, he also speaks of ministry gifts. These gifts are referred to as the gifts of the Spirit or charismatic gifts. There are nine of them. Now, the interesting thing is, two of the verses from verse 4 through verse 11 tells us that each of us has at least one of these gifts. Verse 7 says, now to each one, each one, that's you, that's me, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So there we see you have been given at least one of these gifts. Verse 11 communicates a very similar thing. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, or one and the same Holy Spirit, and He distributes them to each one as he, just as He determines. Here we see again, Paul repeats it. You have been given at least one of these gifts. Now, all these nine are supernatural. You can't get them from reading a book. You can't get them at the bookstore. You can't get them from going to college. You can't get them because you try to buy them. You can't get them because of working for them. You can't get them because you come to church every Sunday. They don't operate like that, nor are they distributed like that. You can't even pick which one you want. Verse 11 says, the Holy Spirit gives it to us as He determines. Don't be like me when I was a young believer. I was, I was so eager. I said, God, I want these gifts in my life and operating. And then I didn't know how to really activate them. So I just saying, God, if you don't tell me which I have, I'm going to pick one. You can't pick any. It, God gives it to you. And you just have to discover which gift or gifts, plural, that you have. Remember, all these gifts are supernatural. And all these gifts are used for power evangelism, getting people to connect with Christ, 
or getting people to get a breakthrough so they can grow in their relationship with Christ. Now, let's try to simplify so we can wrap our minds around it. But keep in mind, it is a very complex topic, and I'm only going to give you a working knowledge of these gifts. And today I'm going to be focusing on one category of these gifts, but I'll give you the three categories. You take the nine, and you can put them into three distinct categories because the categorization of the gifts help you understand how they function. Three categories, revelational gifts, power gifts, inspirational gifts. Three distinct categories. Now, the revelational gifts, they encompass the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. That means these three gifts all reveal information. They unmask information. The word of wisdom, it gives information about the future. What you just saw me ministering to the gentleman over here about pastoral ministry. His name is Mark. And I said, the smell of sheep's upon you. You're going to be that. But not now. Now, wax on, wax off. That's because that's the word of knowledge. Past, present, word of wisdom, future, predictive. The word of knowledge, it is historical facts and data. I ministered to that woman. You come from a line of pastors and pastoral ministry. Past. But you've been, you know, hemmed in, so to speak. Now we're going to help you get to the future. Discerning of spirits is what happened in John 1, verse 47, for example. The moment Jesus sees Nathanael, he says to Nathanael, an Israelite in whom there's no guile, no trickery, no deceit. In other words, the moment Jesus saw him, he knew this guy, he's just, he's a straight arrow. This guy's not a tricky, he's not slick. Nathaniel said, how'd you know me? See, the essence of who he was, that's discerning of spirits. And that, it, that's part of it, but there's much more. Then there's a second category of gifts, the power gifts. The power gifts deal with the gift of faith, the gifts, plural, of healing, and the gift of working of miracles or works of miracles. Those three, they demonstrate power. The gift of faith speaks a miracle. The gifts of healing, healing will take place in terms of physical, mental. And then also we find that the working of miracles, something happens that's totally out of the ordinary, the norm of what nature would create, the physical world. And it just, Jesus turning water into wine. Uh, you do that. You know, it's, that's the working of miracles. So I want you to see that. Now, we're, not, we're just giving you the high level because over the next couple of weeks, we'll dig deep on those categorization. Today, we're going to focus on revelational gifts, but let me just give you an overview. Inspirational gifts, that's the third category. Inspirational gifts, there are three of them. Inspirational means the Holy Spirit comes upon a person and they cause them to speak or to do. Prophecy speaks about the future. Different kinds of tongues. Someone speaks in another language supernaturally, not their prayer language, but a divine and divinely inspired speech or statement and it then must be interpreted so that the congregation or the group where they're with can really understand what was said. That's the inspirational gifts. Again, this is just a big high level, but we'll drill deep. Two things we've learned already. God wants a growing family. Second, God has given you gifts. Again, these gifts are not for the church. You need to then remove every excuse from your mind as to why God can't use you. Why can't he use you? Well, I'm not old enough. Who told you that? Why can't God use you? Oh, I don't know all the Bible. So, no one knows all the Bible. Oh, I, I don't, I've not been to seminary. So, these gifts are not based upon spiritual maturity. These gifts have been given to you. The moment you come to Christ, boom, gifts are inside of you. You need to use these gifts everywhere and anywhere. They're not church gifts. You're dragging someone to church. Why? Because I got to prophesy to you when I get here. No. <laughs> get in the car. I can't say anything until I get there. What are you, crazy? I mean, just <laughs> use the gifts where you are. <laughs> here, gifts reveal God's love. That's what gifts do. Gifts reveal God's love. 
So I want to spend our time looking at the revelational gifts and giving you a wonderful example out of John chapter 4. And as we look at John 4, I want to set up the text. The text is that Jesus was hungry, tired, and thirsty. His disciples went ahead into the nearby village to buy food. Jesus stayed on the outskirts of the village, sat down by a well that was referred to as Jacob's well. While he's sitting there, doesn't have any utensils to draw water with, he's there thirsty, this woman comes out of the village to get water. Now, first of all, it was an odd time of the day for her to come. Second of all, it was a woman's job in that first century, in that part of the world, to get water for their family, but it was always done in a sorority kind of way. That means the women would go together to talk, they'd chit-chat with one another to make this, this chore go by quicker and in a fun way. But she's coming by herself, which shows us then that the women of the village had a problem with her, that she had a problem and they shunned her because they said, look, she's just bad news. So here's this woman, a Samaritan woman, coming to get water. Jesus is there, and Jesus says, hey, can you give me some water to drink? No one said, look, you're a Jew. So Jesus dressed like a Jewish person, looked like a Jewish in terms of person, ethnicity. And, and so she said, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan, and why are you asking me for water? Because you know Jews and Samaritans have nothing to do with each other. Well, uh, what gives? Jesus said, if you knew who it was that was asking you for water, you would ask me for living water. And I'd give you water that cause you'll never thirst again. The woman said, well, how are you going to give me water you have nothing to draw with? Let's pick up the story right then. Verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will thirst, I'm sorry, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Stop there. Let's pull back the scene so you can see what's going on. Don't allow the woman's statement to, dis to distract you. The woman said, I can see you're a prophet. That's true. Jesus was a prophet. He's an evangelist. He's a pastor. He's, an, he's a teacher. He's, you know, you know, he's the apostle. He's all the fivefold ministry. But if we look at what the woman's statement was, we would think then that the gifts of spirit are only for people that are having ministry gifts. Not true. She just made that statement. Doesn't mean all of the nuances of it is true. Jesus used the gift of the word of knowledge. Again, the word of knowledge is a fraction of the mind of God about something in the past or something in the present. It is supernaturally given, and so is divinely and supernaturally given to Jesus. So here's Jesus now, and he wanted to get this woman to, to, to be forgiven of her sins and to experience salvation, power evangelism, and Jesus says, go call your husband. Watch how slick she was. I have no husband. She didn't say, I had five husbands. And now, all her husbands didn't pass away. You know, so I want you to understand that. So this is this scandal going on here. She says, I've had, she, she said, I have no husband. She didn't say, I'm with a guy. She didn't just, look, look, let's just keep that off, wraps. I got no husband, so I, you know, you want to deal with me? Deal with me. Jesus says, that's true what you said. But you've had five husbands. Can you, can you imagine? She's like, I just met the guy. I just, he, I mean, five husbands. And the guy you're with now is not your husband. <laughs> now, notice now, Jesus did not have this word of knowledge, an historical data, historical facts to shame her, to condemn her, to criticize her, to chastise her. None of those things. It was almost as if it's God's calling card. I love you. 
I want you to know I know who you are and I know your pain and I know your past and I want to bring before you your past in a supernatural way, not to harm you, but to help you. I want you to see the purpose of it. At prayer fest, an example of it. If you, if you were not here, there was a young man, he was, you can tell he was backslidden. Or I could tell he was backslidden. And I said, I'm listening to a conversation and you're yelling at your mother. And you're saying, that's your God. I'm not serving your God, that's your God. In other words, I'm going to do what I want to do. Don't force me to serve your God. And I repeated the conversation. I said, you've had that conversation with your mother. Boom, he fell on the floor and started crying. Now, the gifts of spirit not to bring attention to me. Forget me. It's God wants that young man. God wants his heart. And he's just saying, this is a stumbling block here. And so I led him into rededicating his life to Christ. Notice what happened with this woman in the, in the John 4. When Jesus told her that, Man, she knew that. I need this living water that you're talking about. I need to be forgiven. I need to be changed. So she became transformed. What did she do afterwards? She left her jar or her bucket that she was going to use to take water back home, left it there at the well, went back to the village, and told everybody, hey, there's a guy back here. He told me everything about myself. And couldn't he, could he be the Messiah? And verse 39 says what their response was. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So now the village gets saved. And when you read the rest of the following verses, you find out that they went out to Jacob's well. Not, some went because the woman told them and they got saved because a woman, so how old was she in the Lord? Like, uh, three minutes. And she's leading people to Christ. She's sharing her faith. You don't have to have all of this theological knowledge. All you have to do is tell people your story. And if you can learn to tell your story, have a 10-minute version, have a 5-minute version, have an elevator, elevator pitch version, come up with different versions of your story. And when people ask you your story, you tell them your story. I was invited to speak in a Unitarian church, and their theological framework is not according to Scripture. I went anyway. Some people come to Christians and say, don't go there, don't go. <laughs> so forget you. I'm having an opportunity. And then when I went, I said, I want to tell you my story as to why an engineer turned, you know, engineer atheist turned Christ follower. They said, yeah, tell us your story. I told my story. And afterwards, a bunch of them started coming to our Montclair location. And I just want you to know, tell your story. And so the people then left the village, went out by Jacob's well, and then Scripture tells us, not verse 39, but the subsequent verses, that many others believed because of what Jesus then told them directly. They needed the straightforward, in-person, you know, first-hand word or proclamation from Jesus. But I wanted to point out, look at power evangelism at work. One word of knowledge caused one woman to get saved. The woman then goes and tells people in the village. The village gets saved. Then others come out, and the ones who weren't saved got saved when they came out to meet Jesus, all because of one word of knowledge. You tell me that there's no biblical basis to let God use you. May God use you in the supernatural, even when you don't understand everything about it. That doesn't preclude God from using you. Go with the level of knowledge you already have and let God use you based on that and watch what will happen. It is amazing what God will do and what God can do. God wants a growing family. God has given you gifts and gifts reveal God's love. Amen? Would you bow your heart with me, please? I need to deal with the business of leading you to Christ if you've never met the Lord, never met the Savior. Right where you're seated, would you quietly in your heart repeat after me this word of prayer if you'd like to give your heart to Jesus? Heavenly Father, 
I don't understand everything about you, the Bible, relationship with God. But what I do understand is this. I need you. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Wash away my sins. Change me. Help me to serve you starting right now and for the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, I want to congratulate you. Would you just give me a wave? I want to thank you if that was you who prayed with me a moment ago. Thank you. Someone else that prayed with me? Thank you. Welcome to God's wonderful family. Welcome.